Welcome to the Business Focus Podcast. Before we start, can we ask one thing? 74% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you've enjoyed our videos, please could you do me a favor and hit the subscribe button? It helps this channel more than you know, and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the learning gets. Welcome to the Business Focus Podcast. Jonathan Herbs is the host of the Business Focus Podcast. He is a strategic advisor, coach, and mentor to entrepreneurial business owners, CEOs, and senior executives. In this podcast, he chats with entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs of scaling companies. It centers around their entrepreneurial journey so far and their aspirations for their companies. Hi there again. Um, it's my great pleasure today to um, welcome um, Daisy Getty on. I hope that's the right pronunciation of your surname, Daisy, um, who's yes. CEO and creative director of uh, GDR Media Group. Um, welcome. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Pleasure to be with you. I really appreciate you taking the time, so thank you. Um, so why don't we start with um, a little bit about you, your you know, your entrepreneurial journey and, and, and what um, GDR Media actually does, please. Sure. So me, um, I have worn many hats in my life, uh, starting as a journalist, moving into filmmaking, entrepreneurship, um, and now I'm in the phase of humanitarian activist while still holding all of those hats. Um, but the journey of life takes you, gives you great, great opportunity to explore who you really are. And if you are you know, lucky enough, you get to give back in a big way. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be giving back at every, every point of your life. Um, but now I'm in much more of that phase of contribution and growth um, as a human being. But to be specific, um, I have been a journalist for the Australian, for News Corp. I've worked in London. I've worked in the Middle East and America uh, from being a sports journalist to covering foreign affairs, Middle East war, Middle East crisis, and then made some documentaries. And um, I'm now currently in, back in Beirut because I'm back in the phase of looking at most focusing mostly on my like journalism and filmmaking and storytelling because it's a critical crisis situation at the moment. But in between those uh, beginnings and where I am today, I also am the CEO of uh, GDR Media Group in Australia. It's a marketing agency. And um, I've, I've been the head of that company now for 23 years. Fortunately, it's in a place where I have a great team in place and they run the company. I still oversee it. I'm still in touch with them every week. We do stuff over Zoom. Thankfully, the digital era has really enabled us to, to do things like that now. Um, and GDR, you know, has been a blessing. Um, I spend a lot of time, a lot of effort uh, building and growing the agency because um, it required a great deal of attention and uh, building the right team to take care of our clients, manage clients' work from everything from the company started as a, um, a letterbox distribution company 45 years ago. My parents had that company uh, back in the day of, you know, um, direct mail, and which is still active today. Uh, certain organisations still use it as a the most powerful form of advertising for them. But um, I expanded the business from the letterbox to creative, to messaging, to digital, to social media, graphic design, um, websites, because that's what was required. And to be able to serve our clients, we had to broaden our range of services for them. And so, um, you know, that's a brief history. Uh, and the company um, is situated in Sydney, but works with clients all over Australia and, um, you know, d d does work for everyone from governments to major corporates and but our large um, our largest group of businesses are small to medium enterprises okay and how would you define the, the small to medium enterprises just so that the, the audience gets an understanding yeah. specific business types well you know um is it a size of a business or industry or Mostly the small businesses are companies that are, you know, you can go from independent operators yep. um, to small businesses of maybe 10, 20 staff. Um, obviously, there are businesses that are bigger than that. But um, 
the clients that we have, um, yeah, can range from an independent individual operator to, you know, staff of around 20 to 50. In fact, okay. they're, the, they're the large group of, the largest group of um so well, we're talking about the wrong group. Yeah, you know, my client, my my client base sort of ranges from about eight staff up to you know, up to about fifty when when they start with me, and you know that's the um, the the target group that you know is my is my audience if that makes sense. So, what would you do yeah. for you know pick a company, you know fifteen staff? You know, what sort of services would you provide to them? Look, the most important thing is everyone wants clients and everyone wants to grow and everyone wants to make profits that's the core role of a business uh, it doesn't matter what industry you're in your passion and you know we come into those businesses when we're invited in um, to look at what they're doing and who obviously similar to what you ask you know who your your um you know ideal clients because if you model on the ideal client, you can target marketing towards that. So we do the, we have this important conversation at the beginning. And the most, and the, even the most important question is, what do you want to achieve? Where do you want to be in a year, three years, five years? Because if you're not clear about where you're going, the campaign that is, you know, created will be impacted. So understanding where, you know, a, a client, a customer wants where they want to go, where they're at at the moment, really helps us define their strategy and how we can serve them. So, and it depends on what industry they're in, whether they are a plumber to whether they are a, um, you know, a hairdresser or a, um, you know, small business operator in technology, whether they, you know, are IT company, whatever the services they're in, it helps us define how to target them. And we then create a campaign from developing whether we use letterbox, whether we use social media, whether we use, um, you know, a combination, Google AdWords, because all of those elements have to be used these days. You know, unfortunately, there isn't one channel that you can just solely rely on. And depending on your industry will de determine where your clients usually look. You know, whether you're a you know fitness instructor, whether you have a gym, um, whether you're a food operator, we do a lot with um, um, FMCGs. And they know, and we know where their customers mostly look. And a lot of it is online. A lot of it is in social media and being able to target them in their area and geographically um, target them rather than just the old spray and pray approach, which, you know, never works for anyone. Um, so you have to be much smarter and uh, and much more targeted in how you, you you apply your marketing these days otherwise you waste a lot of money and there's no cheap advertising you know it used to be that you know online was cheaper than you know print and distribution but today online is very expensive social media uh, google adwords they're very expensive because everybody is online so you have to be very focused so we take our customers through that journey go away, do the analysis, compare their competitors um, and come back with a with an idea and a, a plan for them. And the most critical thing that we tell them is it's a campaign. It's not a one hit wonder, as you would know. You know, nothing will ever resonate once and all the data and statistics show us that um, with the plethora of advertising the number of um, ads and, and images that come past us on our phone every day, it takes a lot more eyeballs on a subject or a topic or, a, you know, a business for them to convert to even an inquiry. So there has to be a lot of push and we do it in a multi-channel way. But I'm a big, big, big advert and, can, and um, um, believer in the letterbox because the letterbox is empty and if you want direct contact with your customers um, obviously you can't go to no junk mail letterboxes but there is a wonderful channel direct to your customer uncluttered and they will get it in their hand and so we see smart businesses um, and governments um, big institutions that need to get 
the message in, still applying this uh, form of marketing to be able to cut through the noise that's around today. Yeah, that, you know, it's interesting you say that. Um, you know, I'm in, a, um, in Barrel, which is um, a regional town, sort of an hour and a half of the city. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's fascinating when I get, you know, as, as simple as um, a fridge magnet, you know, with yeah. the guy who'll fix my dishwasher. Yeah, guess where yeah. it goes on the fridge. On the fridge. <laughs> exactly. Um, and yeah. that's really powerful, you know, powerful direct mail. It is very, you know, we have a lot of plumbers and gyms and tradies that still use it. And they say, we've tried everything and this is the most powerful yep. form of lead generation for us. Yeah. Yeah, no, I could understand that. So, um, so it's interesting we're talking on Zoom from, and you're in, in Lebanon. I was again. So, my next question is about the pandemic. You know, what actions you took when the pandem mm -hmm. pandemic hit and um, what has stuck with your business going forward? Obviously, Zoom is one of those. Yes, so the pandemic was a shock, i got to tell you. I thought it was just going to be a fad, you know, and be all over, but it was, you know, a month into the pandemic and the government making all of these announcements and these measures that were implemented, and I said, oh, my God, this is actually serious. You know, this is not going to go away really quickly. So, so it, where, were um, you when, where were you when? The, when in, when Sydney, the in Sydney, yeah. I was in Sydney and got in, you know, got locked down like everyone else for a year and a half. And then I escaped in 2021 because um, the film I was uh, finished completing was invited to the Cannes Film Festival. So I got special clearance to attend. And But I was in Australia. It was um, the most confronting thing as a business owner I had had, dealt, had to deal with. And we were at about 20, 22 staff at that time. And obviously, you know, everyone stopped advertising because that's the first thing that goes, you know, in businesses when you there's no one to advertise to because everyone's stuck at home, there wasn't any business. So I um, went into panic for about five minutes <laughs> and then went to what every sensible person does, talks to my advisors, you know, accountants, lawyers, um, read the information, spoke to other business leaders, and I just took in the information. I calmed down, read what was going on, understood that we needed to apply different uh, measures immediately. And it was obviously sending people home. They were going to work from home. If there was no home, it was we had to implement real strict measures of, you know, the um, salary control. So all of that stuff that came in for everyone else, we had to apply. But at the same time, you know, we waited three months and then we knew that this was going to be an, an extended, um, you know, break or delay. So we had to do the real culling of the team. And it was important to assess then the value of the team. It gave me a great opportunity to reevaluate all of my team members and the value that they brought to the business and the value long, long term. And those that obviously I realised weren't contributing at the highest level for the business, which is what you need always, not just in times of crisis, I felt more at ease to release. You know, we put them on the the, the plan that the, the government has had created for those but then when it became three six months in we we had to let them go we we terminated the position and we started to shrink the business into the core team and eventually we ended up with about 11 people over 12 months of working this um you know this um, strategy to bring it down to the most valuable employees and so this should be, you know, very important for every employee to consider that every employer needs every employee to work at their highest level all the time, not just sometime. And you never know when that moment is going to come where decisions have to be made. And they do come in businesses because you're not sure what's happening behind the scenes, what, what difficulties businesses are going through or what expansion plans and will that person be able to move into the next level of growth for a company. So there's growth and, and contraction considerations. 
And so it was a really important time for me to go through that process, um, reevaluate the value of the team and bring it down to a core team of employees. And we, I, I still actually then crazily enough was determined because I was in growth phase and we had these plans that I didn't want to um, put aside. I still though, probably six months in hired people. I hired better people. I hired a general manager who was going to oversee the business and take it to another level of growth. So we went through both of those considerations, but we tried to, I tried to um, reevaluate re exactly the kind of skill set um, and culture people, you know, I, identify culture in an individual to bring them into the team. And so, you know, it's um, stead of, it held us in good stead. And we, um, you know, the business contracted because of the economy, uh, not because of business practices, but we were able to bounce back and we reserved, you know, uh, we preserved our, our um, cash flow with wise accounting advice um, and, you know, and then continued uh, when the market picked up again and, and uh, still going strong, but with a smaller team, more focused and, um, yeah. Thank you. That's about it. I mean, you know, it, it, we all had to make really hard decisions at that, at that, at that time um, as entrepreneurs. And I remember, you know, evaluating my team at the time at, at the time as well and, and working out, you know, as it turns out, most, most of my team are, are contractors, but, um, you know, how, how to pivot and how we could pivot and how we could protect people. It was, it was a really hard time. Don't you love that word, pivot? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it became the word of the of the uh, of the. Okay. Well, you know, and but you know, that's one of the things about being an entrepreneur. Of course, is we have to be prepared um, and thinking ahead. And you know, if something's not working, you know, change. Yeah, and definitely. Flexibility is one of those. Definitely. Things. So, to me, what does the future like look like? And and what do you see as your major challenges in the business going forward? Um. It's always team, you know, making sure you keep the right people, making sure you're bringing in the right people, making sure they're committed, even in Lebanon. So I've got a business now in Lebanon and it's, um, I've got a team, we're up to eight people. We're, we're also looking at ways of uh, expanding GDI into Lebanon. So we've got a bit of a base here for the company. We're trying to resource from Lebanon because of the economic crisis. Salaries are much cheaper here. Talent is very high. They're a very highly educated um, uh, group of people. They, you know, not only do a degree, they do masters, they do PhDs. They're very keen to work. Um, there's a lot of Lebanese um, employed across the world in, in companies all over the world. Um, and so it was a good decision. So we've got people here working for GDR and uh, doing creative and um, those sort of elements uh, for the business and strategy. And I also have another company here, which is the film production company. And this is you know, continuing that side of uh, my, my purpose and my passion and my expertise. And, you know, the, the future is quite interesting. It's, um, it's, not it's never ending I'm there's no end of work and opportunity and um you know ideas that uh, that are coming and and I'm implementing there's a lot of new strategies and working in the media in Lebanon for, as an Australian uh, media uh, you know individual is uh gives gives me a lot of cut through gives me a lot of uh, opportunity to speak to people on a different level and bring awareness not only to Australia but to the world because the work I do is in English, um, which is, you know, most of the media, we have a diverse media in Lebanon. They, they're English, French, Arabic are very, very common throughout the whole country. It's part of the education process from when they're young to learn two to three languages. Um, but media is um, at a different level. So, and, and because of my training working for you know Murdoch working London Times and stuff it's a different um, I bring a different 
perspective uh, to the to the media landscape here. So with GDR, we you know we're um, still working strong. The team is um, solid. We we have you know as I mentioned, 11 uh, full-time members in Australia. We have we do employ contractors on an annual basis. There are contracts that are that re require thousands of people to employ, be employed at different times of the year across the country. And my team manages that. We have very strong uh, systems and processes, which every business, every business needs. If you are not able, if you are frustrated as a business owner, if you're exhausted um, and if you are wearing a million hats, it means that you need systems and processes. You need to delegate and be able to be able to delegate, you need to have procedures, systems and processes. And this is one of the things that I learned probably 15 years ago as a business was growing. I had a business coach. I did a lot of business training because uh, you know my background is journalism and I hadn't really done business. But I learned the power of processes and procedures, which is why today I can leave the company in good hands, oversee it from afar because they, they follow processes and procedures and they're very diligent to it. And that's I'm doing that also in Lebanon, but on the media side, on um, on you know news and, and and story creation interviews, the work that I do in the digital media as well as uh, formal media implementing um, processes and procedures. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I relate a bit to, um, to what, you, you, what you say. I, um, in a past life, in going back to about 2011, I was CEO of a, um, an organisation called the Australia, Australian Gulf Council, as in the, the, the Gulf countries. And I merged that with the, the Australian Arab Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So I was actually the CEO of the Australian Arab Chamber of Commerce and wow. Industry for a while. Wow. Um, yeah, of course, the Lebanese diaspora um, is in incredibly strong here in Australia, and um, and their connections based yes. on are very very strong. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and there's a lot of work that in the uh, Middle East. You know, with Saudi Arabia, it's twenty thirty, massive number of um, opportunities, and there's a lot of. It was like you know the Dubai twenty five years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Saudi's on exponential trajectory. There are millions of jobs being created, um, and you know the King Mohammed bin Sultan is very determined to transform the image of uh, Saudi Arabia. And we've seen some extraordinary. Excuse me, sorry for the uh, motorbike just driving past. Um, yeah, he's. Uh, we've seen some extraordinary changes in Saudi Arabia, particularly relate in relation to women being able to drive, wearing whatever they want. They're not having to wear the hijab. Um, and not having to have chaperones, um, you know, there's so much that we would never have envisaged ten years ago happening in Saudi Arabia. So yeah. it's wonderful for um, in the Middle East. Yeah, I actually lived in, and worked in Abu Dhabi and Dubai for eleven years, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and with the with Aki and uh, the, the the Gulf Council, I took a number of um, uh, business uh, groups through Saudi. It was, it was absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, Yes. So I think you, you may already answer my next question, which is the biggest learning since uh, you've been been a business owner. You talked about getting the processes and operations and checklists and SOPs in place, which allows you to manage your business remotely. Is there anything else there in the, um, of your business, our biggest learnings? Uh, the importance of mentors. You know, I wouldn't have been able to do what I do and have achieved what I've achieved if I didn't have strong mentors. And they were some of the brightest business minds in Australia, um, from former you know, Entrepreneur of the Year to leading executives in major corporations. Uh, mentors have tread the path that you're treading, you're currently going through and, and dealt with problems um, and have a greater insight um, to provide you with shortcuts to avoid future problems or how to manage it because business is all about problems, right? We know that it's one problem after another after another. And, you know, I did business mastery with Tony Robbins, who I'm sure everybody knows. Um, the man was my lifesaver. I was going to go back and do an MBA. I was going to go do all these business courses so I could know how to grow my business. But um, 
a friend put me on to Tony Robbins and I went to do business mastery one, business mastery two, I did all of the courses. And in, you know, concentrated periods of time, I basically got an MBA, but a much more pragmatic, practical MBA with real um, strategies that I could implement instantly. Now, I, I mentioned him because, you know, he said, you know, when we we're doing one of the business masteries that the the sign of the of growing as a business is the measure of the problems you're solving or the problems that come across your desk. And um, I remember this, you know, as the problems became bigger and bigger, I was thinking, oh, okay, or they, they changed. They weren't just a complaint here or a dissatisfied client here or with staff here or whatever. It was bigger issues that required higher level of expertise. So, you know, that helped me have a different perspective towards it, not get paranoid and worried. It was just, okay, so this happens as you grow. You're going to get bigger problems, so you need better advice. You need better a team of advisors and you need mentors. And so I went out, you know, and um, and sourced some great mentors who I would check in with once a month or once every three months. And they really guided me so genuinely. Um, they felt my true passion. They felt I was, I gave them respect and I listened and I applied what they said, not just in one ear or out the other, because they don't have time for that. These are the people at the highest levels. And, uh, and so those people, that was one of my greatest learnings and advice for business owners is make sure you find someone that you respect, that you admire, that you, their path is similar, maybe not in the same industry, but similar to what you find in yourself you want to be doing and, you know, tap them on the shoulder and ask them if they'll mentor you. I mentor a lot of people and I pull people up with me and I, it's my greatest, um, you know, privilege to be able to be asked. And yesterday, literally, I got asked if I would be a mentor for a young business person in in Lebanon, actually. And I get touched every time somebody wants me to mentor them. Um, but it's the a great gift to pay it back, you know, pay it forward, but also take the learning, seek uh, mentors, and make sure to respect them by listening and applying and trying and then going back and saying, hey, I tried this, that happened or this didn't happen or whatever because they know much more than you about how to take it to the next level. You know, it's interesting you say that. I, you know, there's a couple of points in there that, that are interesting. Um, you know, I obviously get paid to be a mentor, um, accountability partner, you know, teacher, confidant, you know, you know, that's what I do. So a very similar thing. Um, uh, a couple of things in there. Um, one is um, industry agnostic. Um, if you've been um, a senior leader, a CEO, an entrepreneur, um, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't have to be the same industry you're in because you know we run up against the same problems all the time. You know? you know, we're we're on interview ninety six in this series, um, or the second series of, of, of this podcast, and um, time and time again, it's the same advice that comes out and. Yeah. It all comes down to, you know, do we have the right strategy? Do we have the right people doing the right things? Do we have the right systems and processes in place? And do we have enough cash? You know, which is exactly the things you've been talking about. And you know, um, a mentor, whether you know, it's a coach, whether it's um, someone you know, whether it's someone you seek out, um, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. The industry doesn't matter. But you know, I laugh at my clients. You know, I'm 63. Um, I've been a CEO about seven times over, 3,000 staff down to my little operation of nine now. And I laughed. I reckon I made every mistake in the book. And that's one of the reasons I'm, re I'm very good at what I do. You know, I learned and the hard way and being burned the hard way. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made, you know. And <laughs> I can imagine. And, 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 money I've lost, and money I've lost, you know, painfully. But um, the thing is, without making those mistakes, you won't grow, you won't expand, you won't learn how to be better. And it's not a problem, you know, as long as you're not making a fatal mistake, you know, there are those people who make take a really high risk and that's a real problem. We should never do that. But, um, but the thing is, mistakes are part of the journey and I don't let them, you know, traumatise me. 
I learn from them immediately, you know, and I, and another, another great saying I, I adopt every time things are apparently going my way is life is happening for me, not to me. Mm. I need to go through this process because if I don't get smacked around a bit right now, I'm not going to be better for something more you know, difficult that might come up in the future. So I take it in my stride, but I take it seriously. I don't forget it because the problem is people get traumatized, but they, they get so paranoid or panicked about it. They don't learn the lesson or they don't do the debrief. You've got to do the debrief and understand with your team, with yourself, with whoever it is, and understand how that happened or what the loophole is. And there's always loopholes, no matter what how tight your processes and procedures are, there's always plug you've got to plug. And by doing a debrief and checking in, um, that's where you pick it up and you plug it under the hole. One thing I want to say, and I really, I find really important for business owners to take on board is not to be scared of your staff and you've got to manage your team. I find so many business owners, and I was one of them, <laughs> intimidated or, oh, I don't want to be um, considered a bitch. You know, I don't want to be the bossy bitch or, you know, I don't want people to hate me. I don't want people to be upset with me. Hey, baby, you're running a business. Their livelihoods is in your hands. The decisions that you are making, in fact, affect them seriously. So if you're not running the business well, they're going to be out of a job anyway. So being their friend ain't helping them ain't helping them at all. It was something I needed to really take into consider. It takes seriously and have to be the best manager, the best leader, the best um, uh, carer for them that I could be by taking things seriously, by having a conversation with them genuinely, bringing them in, having a chat or with the team. I did a lot of teamwork. You know, we'd have monthly meetings, we'd have casual ga gathering catch up, come in, let's have a chat, find out what's going on. But you really do need to say to them, hey, your behavior in this way is affecting the team in this way and the business. And I just want to know, is there an issue? Is there a problem? Are you unwell? Is there probably a problem at home? You have to check in with people because, you know, one toxic person in the company, if not dealt with and removed or managed and helped and whatever you have to obviously help them I'm all for helping but if they can't and they don't want to then there's got to be those conversations to remove them otherwise the whole your whole um you know your your whole team will start behaving at that level they'll bring down the performance level of the entire team to that level because you've allowed that person to get away with it they assume they're allowed to get away with it so I really, that is one of the best lessons I learned. And it's interesting, one of my clients today was talking about um, one of her team members who had, um, you know, performance had declined dramatically over the last six months. And yeah, you know, one of the things I coach is, you know, um, minimum fortnightly one-on-ones, um, preferably weekly one-on-ones. And when she sat down with um, this team member, it turns out that uh, that he has a five-year-old um, uh, autistic child who doesn't communicate and it was affecting everything in their life and he hadn't told them. And it was only when they found out um, that um, yeah, they were able, actually able to help, which is trying to you know, turn the performance around and add everything else. But yeah, as you say, you have to um, understand and then care for, you, care for your team. So the way, when you think of the words... Sorry. Giving him the a safe space to be able to yeah that that's when they yeah when you think of the word successful who comes to mind and why I have the I go in two different places from business people to um, great statesmen you know mm -hmm. um, for me I think of uh, people like. Oprah Winfrey, I think of people like Richard Branson, I think of people like obviously the the main, you know, the main names, you know, Steve Jobs. I love these people because they didn't do it in the orthodox manner. They they really followed, they defied, you know, traditional academia and 
um, you know, Richard Branson and even Steve Jobs dropped out, dropped out of university. But I'm not telling people to do that because you can be very successful. Um, I, I finished my degree and I love education, actually. But, um, you know, Oprah on another level is an extremely successful businesswoman with a great deal of heart on in many formats. Um, and she, you know, has always been a role model for me from when I was younger. I love her because I'm in a diverse range of media and she appeals to me because she's from business owner, you know, only the own a group of companies to having to, you know, and print, present to interview journalists, TV news presenter and stuff. So I find her diversity and listening to her story and the troubles and the, oh my God, the challenges and obstacles she had to overcome was so um so interesting but richard branson he's a he's a he's got a lovely character he's a very introverted gentleman very creative very positive and and vision like he will take risks i like him for his risks um steve jobs i mean there's so many you know obviously apple is an incredible um invention but i the humility of the man at the end he was a bit of a hard ass in business and had a difficult life but um but then seeing what he did with with innovation was incredible and changing the whole face of digital technology was incredible but then I go to people like you know Nelson Mandela is to me uh Princess Diana was a success Mother Teresa was a success these people are idols for me that I honor and um i love their values you see it's about who they stood for and the values that they they represented and how they gave you know empathetically compassionately to humanity because you don't have to be a business success uh it's not about business success it's about human success uh so this is the world that i live in it's not about being financially successful only because there's a lot of miserable people who are very financially successful. Um, but it's who you are as a person. And, and to me, um, those are the people that resonate for me. Um, and I just, I'm going to London at the end of the month, end of October to speak at a couple of conferences. One of them is the women's economic forum. Another one is the creative women's, uh, international creative women's forum. And, um, you know, there's, Last year, I was invited. I've won 100 successful women in business, and was invited to the the event in London. And I met extraordinary women from all over the world, all different types of businesses, all different industries. You know, um, they are successful to me. You know, I love them. They're sisters. They're a tribe, and you know, continuing to grow that, you know, that that family of. Um, women and men who are driven by purpose and have strong well, values. Well, the you know, I was about to say that the six you mentioned all um, are purpose-driven leaders. Yeah, that that's the thing that stands all six out. And it's fascinating here. Personal stories again. I many years ago when I was in the army, I was the equerry to um, the Princess of Wales, um, Princess Diana. So I actually met her and spent you know, yeah. a week and a half with her. Very very special time in my life. And we yeah. and we adopted our first daughter through missionaries of charity, which was Mother Teresa's charity out of Ethiopia. Um, so I've had what? Uh, yeah, talk about purpose driven organisations, just extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. God bless you. Congratulations for well, you. Yeah. Know, I had an incredible and life too. It's amazing. It was to our absolute, absolute, absolutely to our benefit. You know. Um, our three children all adopted all mm. Ethiopia have been um ex they're yeah, they're extraordinary. Yeah. Old, yeah. Old, sixty-three well, three years old and I've got two mind draws in, in a pool at the back of the box. Um <laughs> and it's fourteen degrees. Um okay, we're on the we're on the home run. Um uh business books, podcasts, um, autobiographies that you you'd recommend? Business books. Um Look, I can't. I'm I'm terrible at this stuff. I should make a list of them, but um, I consume 
the thing is I consume, I love reading um, biographies, autobiographies, biographies, because there's no better way to get to know someone and their journey than reading their journey. And that's where you get the greatest insight. So I encourage people to, again, find people that they they respect, um, admire and read their biographies. Um, I, you know, I watch films a lot. Again, those kind of documentaries or the stories of people's lives who are great leaders or great, you know, change makers in the world, not just about business, but I do, you know, the, the McDonald's um, film was phenomenal. Michael Keaton, that was an incredible story. Yeah. You should watch those sort of films because I know it's hard to read and some people don't like reading. Listen to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, watch movies. There's so many incredible movies and documentaries out there that will give you a, a, a you know a, a multi stereo multi level in, in, um, appreciation for the story, um, because we we do consume much more video than we do books these days. But mm. it, I encourage people to do that because I love it. I, I love getting immersed in the story and seeing. I'm a visual. Um, and what else did you ask of me? Uh, yeah, could you name any? But look, I'll give you, I'll give you two. I'll help, I'll help help you out. Two, if you haven't read, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography is from okay. Um, okay. and Andre Agassi's autobiography. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I've, you're both fabulous reads. All right. I'll um, definitely pull them up. I mean, uh, oh my goodness, I have. You know, it's just that I consume so much. It's like I'm, I, I can't. I've got a box. I just pushed a pull of a box of books over there. I, I'm shipping from Australia because I love my books. But um, yeah, I if I think of something, I'll send it to you. you can add it to the note. <laughs> Those two are two of my recent reads, and they are. Okay. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is that's it, it is so interesting. Um, I'm sure. In how he spends all his time, or last his time, um, getting kids off the streets in in California. Um, at, and building after after um, after school care um, activities, it's a bit like our PCYC concept um, yeah. to get kids off the streets and out of crime. Um, it, like really interesting. Um, okay, my last question for you: Any last piece of advice or parting words um, to entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs out there? Yeah, the, probably they've heard it a million times, but never give up. You know, if you really believe in what you're doing and I know this is a question where oh maybe I don't know what I'm doing because we're not enough we're not good enough what the hell who the hell am I kind of doubt that goes across each, you know our minds every single one of us but if it's in your deep in your gut you know and and you believe it it's then all a matter of trial and and error you know you're going to get there and it takes time but don't give up because you just need to keep trying because you haven't quite got the formula that you need to get to where you're going. And this applies to anyone doing anything, whether it's a business or whether it's a dream or whether it's, you know, studying at university or studying something, uh, being a sports person, whatever it might be. If it's something you really want, yes, you have to put in, you have to grit through the difficulty because then the victory is so much sweeter. If it comes too easy, it's, ah, you let it go. But when you've worked hard because you believed in it, you will then really appreciate it. And the learnings you get from it will just take you higher and higher and you won't be scared. And one thing, do some Tony Robbins stuff. I had to go and jump off a, climb a telegraph pole in Fiji, a literal telegraph pole to face my fear and stand on the top of it. Of course, I was harnessed. Face your fears because that's what helps you take those decisions and make, you know, strides in your life, in your life, stride forward. Don't creep forward. Fabulous. Daisy, thank you so much. I've really, well, I always enjoy this conversation, but I've really. <laughs> thank you very much, Jonathan. Me too. I love, I love getting the chance to talk about things and I love the questions the different people pose because it really helps me understand myself better and, and share. Thank you. 
If you are hearing this message, you've listened to the entire episode. And for that, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We hope you enjoyed this new episode. And if you did, please leave us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you watch slash listen. Please share this episode with others who may be interested in this topic. If you want to be a guest on the podcast, please send an email to admin at scaleupgrowth.co. Put be a guest in the subject line and tell me a little about yourself. If you want to gauge where your business growth potential is and identify where the biggest opportunities in your business lie or where the key needs that you need to concentrate on right now are, take our assessment where you will receive personalized advice for improvement. It's quick and free. Go to scaleupgrowth.scoreapp.com. If you would like to work with me one-to-one, I love coaching and get the best outcomes that way. Send me an email to jonathan at scaleupgrowth.co and put one-to-one in the heading. Tell me a bit about your business and let's see how we can apply a great strategy for your business. So that's it for this week. Tune in next time for more great learnings from a scaling entrepreneur.